be in San Francisco. This is sort of a hometown of mine, one of my hometowns. I've been on a tour or a rave, spoken three times and raved twice in the past five For seven days. This is the end, so if I'm comfortable with this stuff at all, I must be comfortable with it this evening. Uh, so, and it's nice to see a small, full house. That's the most uh, exciting kind of audience to talk to, I think. So thank you all for turning out on a rainy night. Uh, before I get into the main body of tonight's uh, entertainment, I want to call your attention to the propaganda for an event in Mexico and another event in Hawaii. These events, in the case of the Mexico event, you get a major slice of the psychedelic community. You get uh, Robert Montgomery, Jonathan Ott, uh, Anne and Sasha Shulgin, Manolo Torres, uh, Christian Resch, uh, Terence McKenna, and others who unfortunately slipped my mind uh, at the ceremonial center of Palenque in Chiapas. We've been doing these events somewhere in Mayan, Mexico for the past 10 or 12 years. Many of you are graduates, which doesn't mean you can't come again, but uh, I want to invite all of you there. If you're interested in ethnobotany, shamanism, ethnopharmacology, altered states of consciousness, the politics of all of this. This is as intense and information-packed an exposure as you can have, and it's straight from the mouths of the scholars and scientists and writers who have spent a great deal of time in that area. So I just want to invite you to that. It's also a great party. It's uh, the height of mushroom season. Uh, there's nothing we could do about that. Uh, so you just are on your own. Uh, well, so when I start out on these tours, I usually have an, uh, an agenda and prepared remarks. And, and then as I make my way through my venues, and I hear the feedback, and I feel the ambiance of, uh, of the people and the, the throb of the zeitgeist, it all sort of just simply dissolves into an ongoing commentary on our moment in space and time, and the various dimensions, adumbrations, and opportunities of our dilemma. But I want tonight to couch it for you in the context of, uh, I guess, an extended metaphor. We could talk about these things many ways, but I find in this particular extended metaphor uh, uh, illuminating. And I start by recalling <clears throat> an observation from someone whose name rarely falls from my lips, uh, and that would be Gurdjieff. And Gurdjieff said at one point, or was known to comment, that people are asleep, he said. And he, by implication, suggested people awaken. Now, I'm not sure if he fully grasped the implication for his own product line had that occurred. Uh, but in any case, you're on it, you're with me, yes. <clears throat> it's very hard to give these lectures in such a way so that every person hears something different, uh, which is what is supposed to be going on, you know. Well, so thinking about this comment that people are asleep, uh, I, I, uh, I see several implications. I ask myself, what is awake in my own notion? And I thought to myself, awake is, for me, awake is where the laws of physics are fully operable. You know, hurled objects shatter, electricity shocks, I cannot fly, 
uh, the laws of physics are in operation. In that domain, I consider myself to be fully awake. Now, in terms of occult and spiritual traditions, the admonition to awaken always seems to imply that higher consciousness is approached through an expansion of clarity and awareness. And I, I, that seems obvious. I don't argue with it as a rationalist. But as somebody who has run the edges, I've noticed something somewhat counterintuitive to that teaching. And it's this. It's that to contact the cosmic giggle, to, to have the flow of casuistry begin to give off synchronistic ripples, white caps in the billows of the coincidental ether, if you will, <laughs> to achieve that it requires it, a precondition is a kind of unconsciousness, a kind of drifting, a certain taking your eye off the ball, a certain assumption that things are simpler than they are almost always precedes what Mircea Eliade called the rupture of plane that indicates, you know, that there is an archetypal world, an archetypal power beyond, uh, behind profane uh, appearances. And in my own life, for those of you who are conversant with my output, uh, when I went to the Amazon in 1971 and had the experiences that are described in true hallucinations, I had been for many months before that in Asia, smuggling, hanging out, and, and I had taken my eye off the ball. I had become very gentle, very relativistic in my uh, approach to other people's opinions and behaviors. I was easy going, is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Too easy going. Uh, and in that situation of semi-unconsciousness and openness, uh, the cosmic giggle approaches. And I compare this, this is closing of a theme, I compare this to sleep or to states that lie between waking and sleeping. And so, again, an odd take on this remark uh, of Gurdjieff's. I remember someone many years ago said to me, uh, they evoked the symbol of the yin and the yang, the two, two tears folded against each other within a circle. And this person, who was no Rishi, Roshi, Geshe, or Guru, but simply observant, said, uh, it's not the black side. It's not the white side. It's the interface. It's the edge. And I have found, uh, by observing sleep, and some of you may recall the motto in Athanasius Kircher's Amphitrium Sapientium, that's chiseled over the alchemist's doorway. I can't do it in Latin, but it says, while sleeping, watch. While sleeping, watch. Uh, and I've noticed that while going to sleep, there is a, a barrier, a place in the process of going to sleep that is like a mercurial edge. It's a river, it's an, a zone of hypnagogia. You often pass through it post-orgasm. It's a place of drifting amoeboid colored after-image lights and then true hallucination, uh, images, strange, transcendental or transpersonal uh, images. Well, so then, so far in the context of pursuing this extended metaphor about sleep, I've talked basically, uh, essentially, about the individual's relationship to the concept, to the fact. But there's also a social or a political, a species-wide implication. 
uh, it occurs to me that at any given moment, because of the way the planet is as a thing, some considerable percentage of human beings are asleep, always, and many are awake. And so if the world soul is made of the collective consciousness of human beings, then it is never entirely awake. It is never entirely asleep. It exists in, uh, I guess you can hear me, it, it, it exists in some kind of indeterminate zone. And this to me is the clue to understanding something that is personally fascinating to me. And it revolves around why people believe such weird things. And, and why, either as a consequence of the approach of the millennium or the breakdown of traditional values or the density of electromagnetic radiation or for some reason uh, a balkanization of epistemology is taking place. And what I mean by that is there is no longer a commonality of understanding. I mean for some people quantum physics provides the answers. Their next door neighbor may look to the channeling of archangels with equal fervor. Uh, I mean, if this is not a balkanization of epistemology, uh, I don't know what it is. Uh, it is accompanied by a related phenomenon, which is technology or the historical momentum of things is creating such a bewildering social milieu that the monkey mind cannot find a simple story, a simple creation myth or, or redemption myth to lay over the crazy contradictory patchwork of profane techno consumerist post McLuhanist electronic pre-apocalyptic existence. And and so into that dimension of anxiety created by this inability to parse reality rushes a bewildering variety of squirrely notions. Um, <laughs> epistemological cartoons, if you will, uh, that, and conspiracy theory in my humble opinion, I'm somewhat immune to paranoia. So those of you who aren't, you know, gaze in wonder. Uh, <clears throat> conspiracy theory is a kind of epistemological cartoon about reality. I mean, isn't it so simple to believe that things are run by the greys and that all we have to do is trade sufficient fetal tissue to them and we can solve our technological problems? Or isn't it comforting to believe that uh, the Jews are behind everything? Or the Communist Party? Or the Catholic Church? Or the Masons? Or, well, these are epistemological cartoons. It's, uh, you know, kindergarten stuff in the art of uh, amateur historiography. Uh, I, I believe that the truth of the matter is far more terrifying. That the real, the real truth that dare not speak itself is that no one is in control. <laughs> Absolutely no one. You know, you don't understand Monica. You don't understand Netanyahu. It's because no body is in control. This stuff is ruled by the equations of dynamics and chaos. Now there may be entities seeking control, the World Bank, the Communist Party, the rich, the somebody others, but to seek control is to uh, take enormous aggravation upon yourself. Uh, because th this, this process that is underway will take the control freak by the short and curly and throw them against the wall. <laughs> it's like trying to control a dream, you see. 
the, the global destiny of the species is somehow unfolding with the logic of a dream. Well, now a Jungian would say, no surprise here, history is the collective dream of humanity. It is run by archetypal energies. It is downloaded by the zeitgeist into the various milieus and epochs of, of uh, which it is composed. Uh, this, this seems reasonable to me. I don't, I don't want to give you the impression it's too linear to understand that what I am saying is that awake is good, asleep is bad. Uh, what I would rather do is explain this whole gradient of possible positioning vis-a-vis -vis your life and your destiny, these choices that you have, and then have people understand that they choose you choose to be asleep or partially asleep or fully awake or to be one part of the time and in some situations and one part of the time and in other uh, situations.